Hello, history enthusiasts, time travelers, and knowledge seekers. Welcome to another journey back in time here on Backdrop History. Introduction The Cold War was a period of intense ideological confrontation between capitalism and communism that lasted roughly from the end of World War II in 1945 to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. It was a global struggle for influence and dominance, primarily between the United States and the Soviet Union, with each side championing its respective economic system and political ideology. This account aims to delve into the intricacies of Cold War capitalism versus communism, exploring the origins, key events, and consequences of this protracted conflict. Chapter 1, Post-World War II Power Struggles Ideological Differences Between the U.S. and the Soviet Union The ideological differences between the United States and the Soviet Union played a pivotal role in shaping the post-World War II power struggles and ultimately fueling the Cold War. The United States, as a capitalist democracy, championed individual freedoms, free markets, and private ownership as the foundation of economic and political systems. In contrast, the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Joseph Stalin, promoted communism, a system based on the principles of collective ownership, central planning, and state control. Capitalism, as embraced by the United States, emphasized the importance of private enterprise, competition, and profit motive. It celebrated individual initiative and economic freedom as the driving forces behind innovation, technological advancements, and economic growth. The American system of capitalism fostered a society in which individuals were free to pursue their economic interests and enjoy the benefits of their labor. This belief in the power of the market and the primacy of individual liberties became a core tenet of American identity and a key component of its foreign policy. On the other hand, the Soviet Union espoused the principles of communism, which sought to eliminate social classes, create a classless society, and achieve equality among individuals. The communist ideology held that collective ownership of the means of production, central planning, and state control would lead to a fair distribution of resources and wealth. Under Stalin's rule, the Soviet Union enforced strict state control over the economy, stifling private enterprise and individual freedoms in the process. Tensions over post-war territorial arrangements and influence in Europe the power struggles between the United States and the Soviet Union were also fueled by tensions over post-war territorial arrangements and influence in Europe. At the end of World War II, the victorious allies sought to reshape the political and territorial landscape of Europe. However, their differing visions and interests quickly became apparent. The Soviet Union, having suffered immense devastation during the war, aimed to establish a buffer zone of friendly states along its western borders to ensure its security. This objective was driven by the country's historical vulnerability to invasion from the West, particularly during the Napoleonic era and World War II. The Soviet Union sought to consolidate its influence over Eastern European countries such as Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany, viewing them as essential in safeguarding its national security and expanding its sphere of influence. However, the United States and its Western allies, deeply concerned about the spread of communism and the potential Soviet expansion, sought to counter Soviet influence in Europe. The concept of containment, articulated by U.S. diplomat George F. Kennan in his famous Long Telegram and later expounded upon in the Truman Doctrine, formed the basis of U.S. policy. Containment aimed to prevent the further spread of communism and Soviet influence by providing economic and military aid to countries threatened by communist aggression. The division of Europe became increasingly evident as the Soviets established satellite states with communist governments in Eastern Europe, while Western Europe aligned itself with the United States through economic and military alliances such as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. 
The Truman Doctrine, along with the Marshall Plan, which provided economic assistance to war-torn European nations, solidified the West's opposition to Soviet expansionism and its commitment to capitalist democratic principles. Chapter 2, Truman Doctrine and Containment the Truman Doctrine, announced by President Harry S. Truman in a speech to Congress on March 12, 1947, marked a significant shift in U.S. foreign policy and laid the foundation for the policy of containment during the Cold War. In his speech, Truman declared that the United States would provide economic and military assistance to countries facing communist threats, particularly Greece and Turkey at that time. The doctrine was a direct response to the escalating Soviet influence in Eastern Europe and fears of communist expansion. The Truman Doctrine was driven by the belief that the spread of communism posed a fundamental challenge to American values, global stability, and national security. Truman, influenced by the ideas of diplomat George F. Kennan, who had outlined the concept of containment, sought to prevent the further spread of communism by containing Soviet influence and supporting countries vulnerable to communist aggression. Containment, as a policy, aimed to stop the spread of communism without directly confronting the Soviet Union militarily. Instead, the United States would provide economic, political, and military support to nations threatened by communist forces or movements. This policy was founded on the belief that if communism could be contained and prevented from expanding further, its inherent weaknesses would ultimately lead to its own demise. The policy of containment shaped U.S. foreign policy throughout the Cold War. It was reflected in various military interventions, diplomatic efforts, and economic aid programs aimed at bolstering anti-communist forces and strengthening alliances. The Korean War, the Vietnam War, and numerous covert operations and proxy conflicts were all part of the wider strategy of containment, with the United States seeking to prevent the spread of communism in different regions around the world. Marshall Plan and its Impact on the Division of Europe The Marshall Plan, officially known as the European Recovery Program, was an ambitious American initiative introduced by Secretary of State George C. Marshall in June 1947. The plan aimed to provide economic aid to war-torn European countries, including both Western and Eastern European nations, to help them recover from the devastation of World War II and rebuild their economies. The Marshall Plan was an integral component of the broader containment strategy and played a significant role in shaping the division of Europe during the Cold War. The Marshall Plan had several key objectives. Firstly, it aimed to revive European economies, which were struggling with massive infrastructure damage, food shortages, and economic instability. By injecting financial assistance into these countries, the United States sought to promote economic stability and prevent the economic hardships that could potentially fuel political unrest or make these nations susceptible to communist influence. Secondly, the Marshall Plan aimed to foster interdependence and create economic ties between the United States and European nations. By encouraging trade and investment, the plan sought to create a prosperous and stable Europe that would align more closely with American interests. This economic interdependence was seen as a means to counter Soviet influence and reduce the appeal of communism in Europe. However, the Marshall Plan also contributed to the division of Europe along ideological lines. The Soviet Union and its satellite states, including East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and others, rejected participation in the plan. Stalin viewed the Marshall Plan as a means for the United States to extend its economic and political influence into Eastern Europe and saw it as a direct threat to Soviet control in the region. As a result, the Marshall Plan deepened the divide between Western Europe, which received substantial economic aid and embarked on a path of economic recovery, and Eastern Europe, which remained under Soviet influence and control. This division, commonly known as the Iron Curtain, became a defining feature of the Cold War era, with Western Europe aligning more closely with the United States and embracing capitalism and democracy, while Eastern Europe fell under the domination of Soviet-backed communist regimes. 
The Marshall Plan's impact on the division of Europe was further intensified by the creation of two rival military alliances, NATO in the West and the Warsaw Pact in the East. These alliances, formed in response to the growing Cold War tensions, solidified the divide and set the stage for decades of political, economic, and military confrontation between the two blocs. Chapter 3, Emphasis on Private Ownership, Free Markets, and Individual Initiative Capitalism, as an economic system, is characterized by several key features, including private ownership of resources and means of production, free markets, and individual initiative. These principles form the foundation of capitalist economies and have played a crucial role in shaping the development of nations and fostering economic prosperity. Private ownership lies at the core of capitalism, where individuals or entities have the right to own and control property, capital, and resources. This includes land, factories, businesses, and other productive assets. The ownership of property provides individuals with the incentive to invest, innovate, and take risks in pursuit of economic gain. It allows for the accumulation of wealth and the ability to make independent decisions regarding the allocation of resources. In a capitalist system, free markets play a central role. Free markets are characterized by voluntary exchanges between buyers and sellers, driven by supply and demand. Prices are determined through market forces, reflecting the scarcity of goods and services, as well as consumer preferences. The absence of government intervention or excessive regulation in market transactions allows for competition, which in turn leads to efficiency and optimal allocation of resources. Free markets enable individuals and businesses to make independent decisions regarding production, consumption, and investment, based on their own interests and assessment of market conditions. Individual initiative is another essential aspect of capitalism. Capitalist economies encourage individual entrepreneurship and innovation. Individuals have the freedom to start businesses, create new products or services, and pursue opportunities for profit. This entrepreneurial spirit fosters economic dynamism, as individuals are motivated to take risks and introduce new ideas, technologies, and methods of production. It is this freedom of initiative that drives competition, economic growth, and the development of diverse industries and sectors within a capitalist economy. The role of capitalism in fostering innovation, technological advancements, and economic growth. Capitalism has historically demonstrated a remarkable capacity to foster innovation, drive technological advancements, and spur economic growth. The pursuit of profit and competition in a capitalist system provides strong incentives for individuals and businesses to invest in research and development, leading to the creation of new products, processes, and technologies. In a capitalist economy, Entrepreneurs and businesses are driven by the desire to gain a competitive edge and capture market share. This drive encourages them to invest in innovation and develop new technologies that can enhance productivity, reduce costs, and improve the quality of goods and services. The profit motive provides a powerful incentive for risk-taking and investment in research and development, as successful innovations can generate significant financial rewards. Technological advancements resulting from capitalist systems have had transformative effects on societies and economies. Innovations such as the steam engine, electricity, the automobile, and the internet have revolutionized industries, increased productivity, and improved living standards. Capitalism has allowed for the rapid diffusion and adoption of new technologies, as markets reward those who can efficiently produce and deliver innovative products and services to meet consumer demands. Economic growth is another notable outcome of capitalism. Through its emphasis on private ownership, free markets, and individual initiative, capitalism creates an environment conducive to economic expansion. By encouraging investment, entrepreneurship, and innovation, capitalist economies can achieve higher levels of productivity, leading to increased output and higher living standards over time. 
capitalism's ability to allocate resources efficiently, adapt to changing market conditions, and foster competition drives economic growth and allows for the efficient utilization of available resources. Additionally, capitalism promotes specialization and division of labor, which enables individuals and businesses to focus on areas of expertise and efficiency. Specialization, coupled with the freedom to trade and exchange goods and services, allows for the realization of economies of scale and the efficient utilization of resources, leading to increased overall productivity and economic output. Chapter 4, Democracy and Individual Liberty Democracy and individual liberty are core principles that have shaped political systems and societies around the world. Democracy refers to a system of government in which power is vested in the people, who exercise their authority through free and fair elections, while individual liberty encompasses the freedoms and rights of individuals to express themselves, participate in political processes, and pursue their own goals and interests. These principles have been central to the development of modern democratic societies, with a focus on political freedoms, civil rights, the rule of law, and the pursuit of happiness. Political freedoms form a crucial aspect of democracy and individual liberty. These freedoms include the right to free speech, assembly, association, and political participation. In democratic societies, individuals have the right to express their opinions, engage in peaceful protests, form organizations and political parties, and vote in elections. Political freedoms ensure that individuals have a voice in the decision-making processes that affect their lives, allowing them to influence public policies and hold their governments accountable. Civil rights are fundamental to the protection of individual liberty within a democratic framework. Civil rights encompass the rights of individuals to be treated equally under the law, without discrimination based on factors such as race, gender, religion, or ethnicity. These rights include the right to equality before the law, the right to non-discrimination, the right to due process, and the right to personal security. Civil rights ensure that individuals are protected from arbitrary government actions and guarantee their inherent dignity and worth. The rule of law is a critical principle in democratic societies that ensures the protection of individual liberty. The rule of law establishes a system in which laws are applied impartially, without favoritism or discrimination, and where no individual, including government officials, is above the law. It provides a framework that safeguards individual rights and limits the power of the state. The rule of law guarantees predictability, fairness, and stability, creating an environment in which individuals can exercise their freedoms and pursue their interests without fear of arbitrary or unjust interference. The American dream is an embodiment of the ideals of democracy and individual liberty. It reflects the belief that every individual, regardless of their background, has the opportunity to achieve success, upward mobility, and personal fulfillment. The American dream emphasizes the pursuit of happiness, which encompasses not only material wealth but also personal and spiritual well-being. It encapsulates the idea that individuals are free to set their own goals, pursue their passions, and shape their own destinies, within the framework of a democratic society that upholds individual rights and liberties. The concept of the American dream has inspired countless individuals to seek better lives and has been a driving force behind social and economic progress in the United States. It has motivated individuals to overcome challenges, embrace innovation, and contribute to the growth and development of the nation. The pursuit of happiness, as a fundamental aspect of individual liberty, has fueled entrepreneurial spirit, creativity, and the pursuit of personal and professional aspirations. Chapter 5, Cold War Capitalist Alliances Formation of NATO The formation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, stands as one of the most significant Cold War capitalist alliances. Established on April 4, 1949, NATO was a defensive military alliance formed by the United States, Canada, and several Western European nations. 
Its primary objective was to counter the perceived Soviet threat and prevent the spread of communism in Europe. NATO's formation was a direct response to the increasing Soviet influence in Eastern Europe and the Berlin blockade of 1948 to 1949. The participating nations recognized the need for a collective defense arrangement to safeguard their security against potential Soviet aggression. The cornerstone of NATO was Article 5, which stated that an armed attack against any member would be considered an attack against all, and each member would respond collectively to defend against such aggression. NATO provided a platform for the United States to assert its leadership in the capitalist bloc and demonstrate its commitment to the defense of Western Europe. The U.S. played a significant role in shaping the organization, both militarily and politically, and provided substantial resources to bolster the alliance's capabilities. NATO became an essential pillar of U.S. foreign policy, ensuring American influence in Europe and serving as a symbol of transatlantic solidarity during the Cold War. Economic cooperation through organizations like the International Monetary Fund IMF, and the World Bank. In addition to military alliances, economic cooperation among capitalist nations played a crucial role in the Cold War. Organizations such as the International Monetary Fund IMF, and the World Bank emerged as key institutions fostering economic stability and development within the capitalist bloc. The IMF was established in 1944 to promote international monetary cooperation and facilitate the stability of the global financial system. It aimed to address economic imbalances, provide financial assistance to countries in need, and promote economic growth through the stabilization of currencies and the facilitation of trade. The IMF became a forum for economic cooperation among capitalist nations, allowing them to coordinate policies, exchange information, and promote economic stability and growth within the Western capitalist framework. The World Bank, officially known as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development IBRD, was also established in 1944. It aimed to provide financial and technical assistance to war-torn countries and promote their post-war reconstruction and development. The World Bank focused on financing infrastructure projects, providing loans, and offering technical expertise to help rebuild and modernize economies devastated by the war. It played a significant role in supporting the economic recovery and development of Western capitalist nations and facilitated their integration into the global economy. Both the IMF and the World Bank represented an economic collaboration among capitalist countries, providing financial assistance and promoting economic stability, growth, and development. They also acted as instruments of influence for the United States and other capitalist powers, as they played a central role in shaping economic policies and encouraging adherence to capitalist principles among member nations. Furthermore, bilateral economic agreements and trade partnerships were formed among capitalist nations to strengthen economic ties and enhance cooperation. These agreements aimed to liberalize trade, remove barriers, and promote economic interdependence among capitalist economies. They fostered the growth of multinational corporations, facilitated the exchange of goods and services, and accelerated economic integration within the capitalist bloc. Chapter 6, Communism, the Soviet Experiment, Economic System, Collective Ownership, Central Planning, and State Control. The economic system, based on collective ownership, central planning, and state control, commonly known as socialism or communism, has been a significant force in shaping societies and economies throughout history. This economic system is characterized by the collective ownership of resources, means of production, and distribution, with the state playing a central role in planning and regulating economic activities. It is founded on the goals of achieving equality, social justice, and the elimination of class distinctions. Collective ownership is a fundamental aspect of this economic system. It entails the transfer of ownership and control of key industries, enterprises, and resources from private individuals to the state or the collective. In socialist and communist societies, 
The state or the community holds ownership rights over land, factories, natural resources, and other means of production. Collective ownership aims to ensure that the benefits and outcomes of economic activities are shared equitably among the members of society, rather than being concentrated in the hands of a few individuals or private entities. Central planning is another essential feature of this economic system. It involves the allocation of resources, setting production targets, and determining the distribution of goods and services through a centralized authority, typically the state. The central planning apparatus is responsible for coordinating economic activities, determining production levels, and making decisions about investment, consumption, and distribution. The goal is to ensure efficient utilization of resources, prioritize social needs, and pursue broader societal objectives. State control is a key aspect of this economic system. The state, as the central authority, exercises control and regulation over economic activities, including production, pricing, investment, and trade. It establishes policies, laws, and regulations to guide economic behavior and ensure adherence to the broader goals and principles of the system. State control is intended to prevent exploitation, ensure fair distribution of resources, and maintain social stability. The goals of equality, social justice, and the elimination of class distinctions are intrinsic to the economic system based on collective ownership, central planning, and state control. These objectives stem from the belief that society should be organized in a way that eliminates or minimizes social inequalities and class divisions. This system seeks to create a more egalitarian society by redistributing wealth, providing equal opportunities, and guaranteeing access to essential services, education, healthcare, and social welfare. It aims to address historical injustices such as exploitation and poverty, and promote the well-being of all members of society. Proponents of this economic system argue that it offers a path to social justice as it seeks to eliminate disparities, ensure basic needs are met, and provide a more equitable distribution of resources and opportunities. They contend that collective ownership and state control can lead to a more efficient and fair allocation of resources, as decision-making is guided by broader societal considerations rather than individual profit motives. Critics, on the other hand, point to the challenges and limitations of this economic system. They argue that central planning and state control can lead to inefficiencies, lack of innovation, and stifling of individual initiative. The concentration of power in the hands of the state can also raise concerns about potential abuses and lack of political freedoms. Additionally, critics question the feasibility of achieving complete equality and argue that it may lead to a loss of incentives for productivity and innovation. In practice, various countries have adopted different variations of this economic system, ranging from more moderate forms of socialism with a mix of public and private ownership to more rigid forms of communism with complete state control. The experiences and outcomes of these systems have varied significantly, with some societies achieving notable social progress and economic development, while others have faced challenges, inefficiencies, and social unrest. Chapter 7, Centralized Authority and State Control, Communist Party Rule and Authoritarianism Centralized authority and state control are fundamental characteristics of systems governed by communist parties. In such systems, the ruling party holds significant power and exercises authority over all aspects of governance, including the economy, political institutions, and society at large. Communist party rule often leads to a highly centralized and authoritarian form of government, where the party maintains a tight grip on power and tightly controls various aspects of people's lives. Communist party rule is characterized by the dominance and monopolization of political power by a single party, typically guided by Marxist-Leninist ideology. The party acts as the vanguard of the proletariat, claiming to represent the interests of the working class and advocating for the establishment of a classless society.
The party's authority is derived from its claim to possess a superior understanding of historical processes and the path to a socialist or communist utopia. Under communist party rule, the party exercises substantial control over all branches of government, the military, and key institutions such as the judiciary and media. This concentration of power allows the party to shape and dictate policies, determine economic priorities, and suppress dissent. The party hierarchy, led by a top leadership corps, makes crucial decisions regarding governance, economic planning, and strategic direction. The ruling party is responsible for implementing policies and initiatives designed to achieve its ideological objectives. Authoritarianism is a hallmark of communist party rule, where the state exercises considerable control over individuals' lives and limits their political freedoms and civil liberties. The ruling party often employs a variety of tools and mechanisms to maintain its authority and suppress opposition. These can include restrictions on freedom of speech, assembly, and association, as well as limitations on political competition and pluralism. Communist regimes frequently employ surveillance, secret police, and repressive measures to stifle dissent and maintain social control. The role of propaganda and censorship is crucial in systems characterized by centralized authority and state control. The ruling party utilizes propaganda as a means to shape public opinion, disseminate its ideological principles, and maintain its legitimacy. State-controlled media outlets and other communication channels are utilized to promote the party's narrative, glorify its leaders, and propagate its policies. Propaganda campaigns often aim to create a sense of unity, national identity, and loyalty to the party and its leaders. Censorship is a key tool employed by communist regimes to control information flow and limit access to alternative perspectives. The state exercises strict control over media outlets, both traditional and digital, and restricts or censors information that may challenge or contradict the party's ideology or policies. This control extends to the arts, literature, and cultural production, where creative expression is subject to scrutiny and censorship to ensure conformity with party values and objectives. The control of information through propaganda and censorship allows the ruling party to shape the narrative, control public discourse, and prevent the spread of dissenting views. It helps to maintain social stability and ensure the dominance of the party's ideology. By tightly controlling information flow, communist regimes seek to prevent the dissemination of ideas that may undermine the party's authority or challenge its legitimacy. Critics argue that centralized authority, state control, and the accompanying authoritarian practices can lead to a lack of political freedoms, stifling of dissent, and the erosion of individual liberties. They point to instances of human rights abuses, political persecution, and the suppression of civil society under communist regimes. Critics also argue that the absence of checks and balances, combined with the concentration of power, increases the risk of corruption, nepotism, and abuse of authority. Chapter 8, Cold War Communist Alliances, Formation of the Warsaw Pact and Support for Communist Movements. The Cold War was marked by the formation of alliances between communist states aimed at advancing their shared ideology and countering the influence of capitalist powers. The most prominent of these alliances was the Warsaw Pact, which served as a military and political alliance among communist countries in Eastern Europe. Additionally, communist powers, particularly the Soviet Union, provided support for communist movements and revolutions around the world, seeking to expand their influence and promote their revolutionary agenda. Formation of the Warsaw Pact The Warsaw Pact was established on May 14, 1955, in response to the formation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization NATO, by the Western capitalist powers. The treaty was signed by the Soviet Union, Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, and Romania, effectively creating a military alliance that would serve as a collective defense against any potential aggression from NATO. 
The formation of the Warsaw Pact solidified the influence of the Soviet Union over its satellite states in Eastern Europe. The pact aimed to maintain political control over these countries, ensuring their alignment with Soviet interests and preventing any deviation from the communist ideology. The Soviet Union exercised significant influence over the decision-making process within the Warsaw Pact, dictating policies, military strategies, and economic cooperation among member states. The primary objective of the Warsaw Pact was to counterbalance the perceived threat posed by NATO and prevent the encroachment of capitalist powers into Eastern Europe. The pact established a collective security arrangement, with member states pledging to come to the defense of any member country in the event of an attack. This mutual defense provision aimed to deter potential aggression from NATO and solidify the military dominance of the communist bloc in Eastern Europe. Support for Communist Movements and Revolutions Communist powers, led by the Soviet Union, actively supported and provided assistance to communist movements and revolutions around the world during the Cold War. These efforts aimed to expand the influence of the communist ideology, promote revolutionary struggles, and undermine capitalist powers and their allies. The Soviet Union viewed itself as the vanguard of the global communist movement and considered it a duty to support and export the revolution. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union provided funding, arms, and military training to communist and leftist movements in various regions, particularly in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The support was often channeled through the Comintern, Communist International, and later through the Cominform, Communist Information Bureau, which sought to coordinate the activities of communist parties worldwide. The support provided by communist powers varied in nature and scope. It ranged from diplomatic assistance and ideological guidance to direct military aid and intervention. The Soviet Union, for example, supported communist forces during the Chinese Civil War, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, supplying them with weapons, military advisors, and logistical support. Similarly, the Soviet Union provided assistance to socialist movements and governments in countries such as Cuba, Angola, Mozambique, and Nicaragua, among others. Support for communist movements was driven by the belief in the universal applicability and desirability of communism, as well as the strategic interests of the Soviet Union and other communist powers. It aimed to challenge the dominance of the capitalist powers, weaken their influence in strategically important regions, and expand the sphere of communist influence. By supporting communist movements, the Soviet Union sought to create a network of sympathetic governments and revolutionary forces that could challenge the global capitalist order. However, the success and impact of communist support for movements and revolutions varied significantly. While some revolutions, such as the Cuban Revolution, resulted in the establishment of communist governments aligned with the Soviet Union, many others faced challenges and failed to achieve their objectives. Factors such as local dynamics, the strength of counter-revolutionary forces, and the influence of rival powers shaped the outcomes of these revolutionary struggles. Chapter 9, Berlin Blockade and Airlift, 1948-1949 Soviet Attempt to Isolate West Berlin and the Successful Western Response The Berlin Blockade and Airlift, occurring from 1948 to 1949, was a pivotal event during the early years of the Cold War. It unfolded when the Soviet Union, aiming to assert control over West Berlin, initiated a blockade in an attempt to isolate and subjugate the Western-occupied sectors of the divided German capital. In response, the Western powers, led by the United States, organized a massive airlift operation to supply West Berlin with vital provisions, successfully thwarting the Soviet efforts. The Berlin blockade was triggered by escalating tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western Allies, who controlled West Berlin, which was situated deep within Soviet-controlled East Germany. Seeking to consolidate control over the city, the Soviet authorities cut off all road, rail, and water access to West Berlin on June 24, 1948. 
The blockade aimed to force the Western powers to relinquish control of their sectors and recognize Soviet authority over the entire city. The Soviet attempt to isolate West Berlin had severe implications for the city's inhabitants, who faced shortages of essential supplies, including food, fuel, and other basic necessities. The situation was particularly dire during the winter months when temperatures plummeted, exacerbating the humanitarian crisis. In response to the blockade, the Western powers, led by the United States, devised a bold and audacious plan, the Berlin Airlift, to sustain the population of West Berlin and demonstrate their determination to uphold their position in the divided city. The airlift operation involved the systematic transportation of goods and supplies to West Berlin by air, bypassing the Soviet blockade. The Western powers swiftly organized a vast airlift effort that brought together various nations and involved a fleet of cargo planes. The United States, as the primary contributor to the airlift, played a pivotal role, with American military and civilian aircraft delivering a significant portion of the supplies. Other participating nations included the United Kingdom, France, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The success of the Berlin airlift depended on meticulous planning, coordination, and round-the-clock operations. Air corridors were established, connecting West Berlin to airfields in western Germany. Cargo planes, predominantly C-47 and C-54 aircraft, transported vital supplies, including food, coal, medicine, and other essentials, to the beleaguered city. The airlift also involved evacuating vulnerable individuals, such as children and the elderly, from West Berlin. The Berlin airlift soon became a symbol of Western resolve and solidarity, with the international community rallying behind the effort. The sheer scale of the operation was impressive, with planes landing in West Berlin at regular intervals, sometimes as frequently as every few minutes. The pilots and crews faced immense challenges, including adverse weather conditions and landing on short runways, yet they persevered, ensuring a steady flow of supplies into the blockaded city. The airlift operation not only sustained the population of West Berlin but also boosted morale among its inhabitants. It became a source of inspiration, fostering a sense of defiance and determination in the face of Soviet aggression. The success of the Berlin airlift also had significant political implications, underscoring the resolve of the Western powers to protect their interests and maintain a presence in the heart of Soviet-controlled East Germany. Recognizing the futility of their blockade, the Soviet Union finally lifted the blockade on May 12, 1949. The Berlin airlift had achieved its objective, ensuring the survival of West Berlin and reaffirming the Western powers' commitment to their position in the divided city. Chapter 10, Korean War, 1950-1953 North Korea's invasion of South Korea and the subsequent international response, a proxy war between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Korean War, spanning from 1950 to 1953, was a significant event during the early years of the Cold War. It was ignited by North Korea's invasion of South Korea and quickly escalated into an international conflict, ultimately becoming a proxy war between the United States and the Soviet Union. The war had profound political, military, and humanitarian implications, reshaping the geopolitical landscape of East Asia. The Korean War began on June 25, 1950, when the North Korean People's Army, supported by the Soviet Union, launched a surprise attack across the 38th parallel, the dividing line between North and South Korea. North Korean leader Kim Il-sung sought to reunify the Korean peninsula under communist rule, convinced that a swift military victory was attainable. The invasion caught the South Korean forces and their allies off guard, resulting in initial territorial gains for the North. The international response to the North Korean invasion was swift and determined. The United Nations, with the Soviet Union absent from the Security Council due to a boycott, passed a resolution condemning the aggression and calling for the withdrawal of North Korean forces from South Korea. The United States, under the leadership of President Harry S. Truman, 
took the lead in organizing an international coalition to support South Korea. The United States, supported by the United Kingdom, Canada, and other nations, swiftly intervened, deploying troops under the United Nations Command to defend South Korea. General Douglas MacArthur, the commander of the United Nations forces, led a counteroffensive that pushed back the North Korean forces and eventually recaptured Seoul, the capital of South Korea. As the war progressed, it became clear that the Korean War was not merely a localized conflict but a larger proxy war between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, along with its communist allies, provided significant military and economic support to North Korea, including weapons, equipment, and advisors. China, led by Mao Zedong, also entered the war on the side of North Korea, further escalating the conflict. On the other hand, the United States led a multinational coalition in support of South Korea. The United States, with its superior military capabilities, provided substantial military aid, including troops, equipment, and air support. The American-led forces sought to contain the spread of communism in East Asia, viewing the Korean War as a critical battleground in the broader struggle against the Soviet Union and its allies. The Korean War was marked by intense fighting, brutal battles, and significant loss of life. Both sides engaged in large-scale offensives and counteroffensives, resulting in a series of frontline shifts and high casualty rates. The war also witnessed the first large-scale use of jet aircraft and the devastating effects of aerial bombings, contributing to the widespread destruction of infrastructure and civilian casualties. The war reached a turning point with the landing of United Nations forces at Incheon in September 1950. The successful amphibious assault, led by General MacArthur, cut off North Korean supply lines and forced them to retreat. In response, China intervened in late 1950, launching a massive offensive that pushed United Nations forces back below the 38th parallel. The war then entered a protracted stalemate, with both sides locked in a bloody and inconclusive struggle. Efforts to negotiate a settlement to the war were initiated in 1951, leading to armistice negotiations held in the village of Panmunjom. After two years of intense negotiations, a ceasefire agreement was reached on July 27, 1953, bringing an end to the active fighting. The ceasefire established the Korean Demilitarized Zone DMZ, along the 38th parallel, effectively creating a heavily fortified buffer zone separating North and South Korea. The Korean War had profound geopolitical implications. It solidified the division of the Korean Peninsula into the Communist North and the Non-Communist South, establishing a lasting Cold War frontier in East Asia. It also highlighted the willingness of the United States to intervene militarily to prevent the spread of communism, setting a precedent for future conflicts during the Cold War era. The war had a devastating humanitarian toll. Estimates suggest that millions of Koreans were killed, injured, or displaced during the conflict. The war left behind a shattered infrastructure, a divided nation, and a legacy of animosity and tensions that continue to shape the region to this day. Chapter 11, Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962 The tense standoff between the US and the Soviet Union and the negotiation to de-escalate the crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis, which unfolded in October 1962, was a critical event during the Cold War that brought the United States and the Soviet Union to the brink of nuclear conflict. It centered on the placement of Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba, just 90 miles from the coast of Florida. The crisis represented one of the most dangerous moments in human history, as the world watched anxiously to see if the superpowers could find a peaceful resolution to the escalating tensions. The origins of the Cuban Missile Crisis can be traced back to the deteriorating relations between the United States and the Soviet Union. In 1959, Fidel Castro's communist forces overthrew the U.S.-backed regime of Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista, leading to the establishment of a communist government in Cuba. 
Concerned about the spread of communism in the Western Hemisphere, the U.S. government closely monitored the developments in Cuba. In the early 1960s, the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev, sought to strengthen its ties with Cuba and expand its influence in the Western Hemisphere. As part of this strategy, the Soviets decided to deploy nuclear missiles to Cuba, seeing it as a way to deter the United States from attempting a military intervention on the island. In October 1962, U.S. intelligence agencies discovered the presence of Soviet missile installations in Cuba. President John F. Kennedy, after carefully considering the available options, decided that the missiles represented an unacceptable threat to U.S. national security. He ordered a naval quarantine around Cuba to prevent further Soviet shipments of military supplies and demanded the removal of the missiles. The world watched anxiously as tensions escalated. The U.S. military prepared for a potential invasion of Cuba, while the Soviet Union vowed to defend its ally and threatened retaliation if the United States attacked Cuba. The situation grew increasingly dire, and the world teetered on the edge of nuclear war. Amidst the tense standoff, both the United States and the Soviet Union recognized the need to find a way to de-escalate the crisis and avoid a nuclear catastrophe. Back-channel negotiations began, with the U.S. government engaging in secret communication with the Soviet leadership to explore possible resolutions. Diplomatic efforts took place both publicly and privately. President Kennedy delivered a televised address to the American people, revealing the presence of the missiles and outlining his determination to resolve the crisis peacefully. He also made it clear that the United States was prepared to use military force if necessary to protect its national security. Behind the scenes, Kennedy's administration engaged in direct communication with the Soviet government. A series of letters, messages, and proposals were exchanged between Kennedy and Khrushchev. The negotiations were tense and intricate, with both sides carefully considering their options and seeking a way to save face while avoiding nuclear war. The breakthrough in negotiations came when Khrushchev agreed to dismantle and remove the missile installations in Cuba in exchange for a public assurance from the United States that it would not invade Cuba and a private pledge to remove U.S. missiles from Turkey. This private agreement was crucial in resolving the crisis, as it allowed both superpowers to claim victory and de-escalate the situation without losing face. On October 28, 1962, President Kennedy announced the agreement publicly, stating that the United States would lift the naval quarantine and not invade Cuba. The removal of the missiles from Cuba and the withdrawal of U.S. missiles from Turkey took place shortly after, effectively ending the crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis had a profound impact on the Cold War dynamics and nuclear arms control. The crisis highlighted the dangers of nuclear brinkmanship and the potential for catastrophic consequences. It also served as a wake-up call for both superpowers, leading to renewed efforts to establish direct communication channels and arms control agreements to reduce the risk of a similar crisis in the future. Chapter 12, Vietnam War, 1955-1975 U.S. Intervention to Prevent the Spread of Communism in Southeast Asia and the Protracted Conflict's Impact on Superpowers The Vietnam War, spanning from 1955 to 1975, was a protracted and complex conflict that had profound implications for the United States, the Soviet Union, and the countries of Southeast Asia. The war emerged as a result of the Cold War rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, with the United States intervening in an effort to prevent the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. The war's duration, its high cost in human lives, and its impact on both superpowers significantly shaped the geopolitical landscape of the era. The roots of the Vietnam War can be traced back to the post-World War II era when Vietnam was divided into two separate entities, the communist-led Democratic Republic of Vietnam, North Vietnam, and the anti-communist Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam. As part of its policy of containment, 
The United States became increasingly involved in supporting the South Vietnamese government in its fight against communist insurgency, led by the Viet Cong and supported by North Vietnam. The U.S. intervention was driven by its fear of the spread of communism in Southeast Asia, a concern commonly referred to as the domino theory. U.S. policymakers believed that if one country in the region fell to communism, it would have a domino effect, with neighboring countries following suit. They viewed the Vietnam War as a critical battleground in the broader struggle against communism, seeking to prevent the consolidation of a communist regime in South Vietnam. In 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, in which U.S. naval vessels were allegedly attacked by North Vietnamese forces, served as a catalyst for an escalation in U.S. military involvement. The U.S. Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, granting President Lyndon B. Johnson broad powers to use military force in Vietnam. This marked a turning point, as the United States began deploying a significant number of troops to South Vietnam, escalating its military commitment. The Vietnam War was characterized by guerrilla warfare, hit-and-run tactics, and a lack of clearly defined front lines. The Viet Cong, aided by North Vietnam, employed tactics such as ambushes, booby traps, and underground tunnels, making it difficult for the U.S. forces to gain a decisive advantage. The conflict was also marked by the extensive use of firepower, including aerial bombings, artillery, and chemical agents, resulting in significant civilian casualties and widespread destruction. The war had a profound impact on both the United States and the Soviet Union. For the United States, the conflict proved to be a divisive issue domestically, leading to protests, social unrest, and a loss of faith in government institutions. The draft and the disproportionately high number of casualties among young Americans sparked widespread anti-war sentiment and fueled a broader counterculture movement. The Vietnam War represented a significant shift in public opinion regarding U.S. military interventions and set the stage for subsequent debates about foreign policy and military engagements. For the Soviet Union, the Vietnam War presented an opportunity to advance its interests and expand its influence in Southeast Asia. The Soviet Union provided substantial military and economic aid to North Vietnam, including weapons, supplies, and military advisors. While not directly involved in the conflict, the Soviet Union saw the war as a means to challenge U.S. hegemony and project its own power in the region. The Vietnam War served as a Cold War proxy conflict between the two superpowers, exacerbating tensions and adding another dimension to their global rivalry. The war had devastating consequences for the countries of Southeast Asia as well. The conflict resulted in massive casualties, displacements, and extensive destruction. Laos and Cambodia, neighboring countries of Vietnam, also experienced significant turmoil and were drawn into the conflict. The war profoundly impacted regional stability and contributed to political upheaval and social dislocation. The Vietnam War came to an end in 1975 when North Vietnamese forces successfully captured Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, leading to the reunification of the country under communist rule. The war's outcome was a significant blow to the United States, which had invested considerable resources and lives in its effort to prevent the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. Chapter 13, Space Race, the competition between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in space exploration and the significance of the moon landing. The space race, which unfolded during the Cold War era, was a fierce competition between the United States and the Soviet Union to achieve milestones in space exploration. This rivalry began in the late 1950s and continued throughout the 1960s, as both superpowers sought to demonstrate their technological prowess, scientific achievements, and ideological superiority. The race culminated with the historic moon landing in 1969, a feat that held immense propaganda value for both sides. The competition between the United States and the Soviet Union in space exploration can be traced back to the launch of the Soviet satellite Sputnik 1 on October 4, 1957. 
Sputnik became the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth, shocking the world and fueling concerns in the United States about Soviet technological superiority. The successful launch of Sputnik galvanized the U.S. government, leading to the establishment of NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, in 1958 and igniting a fervent drive to catch up with and surpass Soviet achievements. In the early years of the space race, the Soviet Union maintained a significant lead over the United States. They achieved several pioneering accomplishments, including the first human spaceflight, when Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth aboard Vostok 1 in April 1961. The Soviets also achieved other milestones, such as the first woman in space, Valentina Tereshkova, and the first extravehicular activity, EVA, by Alexei Leonov. However, the tide began to turn in favor of the United States when President John F. Kennedy made a bold proclamation in 1961 to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the end of the decade. This ambitious goal, known as the Apollo program, marked a turning point in the space race. The United States devoted significant resources, including funding, manpower, and technological innovation, to achieve this objective. The significance of the moon landing, which took place on July 20, 1969, cannot be overstated. The Apollo 11 mission, commanded by Neil Armstrong, successfully landed the lunar module Eagle on the moon's surface. Armstrong's famous words, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, captured the imagination of the world and symbolized a moment of triumph for the United States. The moon landing demonstrated American technological prowess, scientific achievement, and national resolve. The moon landing held immense propaganda value for both the United States and the Soviet Union. For the United States, it represented a symbolic victory in the space race, as they had achieved their audacious goal of landing a man on the moon before the decade's end. The success of the Apollo program helped restore American confidence, boosted national morale, and projected an image of American exceptionalism and superiority. For the Soviet Union, the moon landing presented a significant setback. Despite their early lead in space exploration, they had been overtaken by the United States in the race to the moon. The Soviet lunar program, which included the ill-fated N-1 rocket and the lunar robotic missions, faced technical difficulties and failed to achieve a manned moon landing. The American success cast a shadow over Soviet achievements and challenged their claims of superiority in space technology. The moon landing also had broader geopolitical implications. The United States saw it as a demonstration of the superiority of their democratic, capitalist system over the Soviet Union's communist regime. It was seen as a triumph of freedom and innovation over oppression and central planning. The United States leveraged the moon landing to project its influence and win the hearts and minds of people worldwide, particularly in countries that were on the fence in the global ideological struggle of the Cold War. In the Soviet Union, the moon landing prompted a period of introspection and re-evaluation of their space program. It led to significant changes in their approach, with a shift in focus toward unmanned missions and space stations. The Soviet Union continued to achieve notable milestones in space exploration, such as the development of the Soyuz spacecraft and the establishment of the Mir space station. However, the moon landing highlighted the technological gap between the two superpowers and had a lasting impact on the trajectory of their space programs. Chapter 14, Arms Race, The Development of Nuclear Weapons and the Superpower Competition The arms race between the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, was a defining feature of the Cold War era. At its core was the development and stockpiling of nuclear weapons, a race that escalated tensions, shaped military strategies, and had a profound impact on the global security landscape. This arms race unfolded against the backdrop of the destructive power of nuclear weapons and the doctrine of mutually assured destruction MAD. The development of nuclear weapons during World War II marked a turning point in human history. 
The United States became the first country to successfully develop and deploy nuclear weapons with the Manhattan Project, which culminated in the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. The devastating impact of these bombings showcased the immense destructive power of nuclear weapons, fundamentally altering the dynamics of warfare and international relations. The Soviet Union, aware of the military and strategic significance of nuclear weapons, embarked on its own nuclear program. In 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tested its first atomic bomb, ending the United States' monopoly on nuclear weapons. This development triggered an arms race between the superpowers as they sought to build up their nuclear arsenals to deter each other and project power on the global stage. The arms race was driven by a combination of strategic considerations, technological competition, and ideological rivalry. Both superpowers believed that possessing a credible nuclear deterrent was crucial to maintaining their respective spheres of influence and preventing aggression from the other side. The arms race extended beyond nuclear weapons to include conventional weapons, missile defense systems, and other military technologies. The doctrine of mutually assured destruction MAD, emerged as a key concept in the arms race. MAD posited that in a conflict between nuclear-armed adversaries, both sides would suffer catastrophic destruction, leading to an unacceptably high cost. This principle became the foundation of nuclear deterrence, as both the United States and the Soviet Union recognized that the use of nuclear weapons would lead to their own annihilation. MAD rested on the belief that a credible second strike capability was essential for deterrence. Both superpowers sought to develop and deploy intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs, capable of delivering nuclear warheads across vast distances, ensuring that even in the event of a devastating first strike, the other side could retaliate and inflict unacceptable damage. This strategic calculus led to the establishment of elaborate command and control systems, underground bunkers, and early warning systems to detect and respond to potential nuclear attacks. The arms race had far-reaching consequences. It led to an exponential increase in the number of nuclear weapons and the destructive power of those weapons. The United States and the Soviet Union engaged in an arms buildup each side seeking to outpace the other in terms of the quantity and sophistication of their nuclear arsenal. The pursuit of nuclear parity fueled a dangerous cycle of escalation, as each new development by one side was met with countermeasures by the other. The arms race also had significant economic implications. Both superpowers allocated substantial resources to their defense budgets to fund military research and development programs, leading to increased military expenditures and diverting resources away from other sectors of their economies. The pursuit of technological superiority in the arms race drove innovation in various fields, including aerospace, materials science, and computer technology. The arms race reached its peak during the 1950s and 1960s, with the United States and the Soviet Union amassing vast nuclear arsenals capable of destroying the world many times over. The Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 brought the superpowers perilously close to a nuclear conflict, underscoring the dangers and risks inherent in the arms race. The arms race began to de-escalate in the 1970s, as both superpowers recognized the need for arms control and strategic stability. A series of arms control agreements, such as the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks SALT, and the subsequent Strategic Arms Reduction Treaties START, sought to limit the number of strategic nuclear weapons and establish verification mechanisms to build confidence and prevent an uncontrolled nuclear buildup. The end of the Cold War in the early 1990s brought a significant reduction in nuclear arsenals, as the United States and the Soviet Union, and later Russia, embarked on further arms reduction measures. However, the legacy of the arms race persists, with both countries still possessing substantial nuclear stockpiles and ongoing concerns about nuclear proliferation and the potential use of nuclear weapons. 
Chapter 15, Soviet Economic Decline, Internal Challenges, Inefficiencies, Gorbachev's Reforms, and the Opening Up of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, once considered a global superpower, experienced a marked decline in its economic strength and stability during the latter half of the 20th century. This decline was characterized by a combination of internal economic challenges, inefficiencies, and ultimately, attempts at reform under the leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev's policies, aimed at restructuring the Soviet economy and opening up the country, sought to address deep-rooted issues but ultimately contributed to the disintegration of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union's economic decline can be attributed to several factors. One of the key challenges was the centralized command economy, which placed economic decision-making in the hands of government planners rather than allowing for market forces and individual enterprise. This top-down approach to economic management resulted in a lack of innovation, inefficiency, and misallocation of resources. The state-owned enterprises that dominated the Soviet economy also suffered from significant inefficiencies. The absence of profit incentives and competition led to a lack of productivity and quality control, making Soviet products uncompetitive on the global market. Additionally, the centrally planned system discouraged individual initiative and entrepreneurship, stifling innovation and technological advancements. Furthermore, the Soviet Union faced substantial demographic challenges. Rapid population growth, coupled with limited resources, placed a strain on the economy. The allocation of resources to meet the basic needs of the growing population, such as housing, healthcare, and education, further strained the Soviet economy. In the 1980s, as the economic challenges became increasingly apparent, Mikhail Gorbachev assumed leadership with a commitment to reform the Soviet economy. Gorbachev's economic reforms, known as perestroika, restructuring, and glasnost, openness, aimed to address the inefficiencies and stagnation that had plagued the Soviet economy for decades. Perestroika aimed to introduce elements of market-oriented reforms and decentralization to the Soviet economy. It sought to increase economic efficiency and productivity by allowing for more decision-making power at the local level and promoting limited market mechanisms. Gorbachev also aimed to encourage foreign investment and promote technological advancements to modernize Soviet industries. Glasnost, on the other hand, aimed to increase transparency and openness in Soviet society, including economic affairs. The policy allowed for a freer flow of information and facilitated public discussions about economic challenges and inefficiencies. The hope was that greater openness would lead to increased accountability and help identify and address economic problems more effectively. While Gorbachev's reforms were intended to revitalize the Soviet economy, they faced significant obstacles. The lack of a comprehensive plan, resistance from entrenched interest groups, and the failure to fully understand the complexities of implementing market-oriented reforms hindered progress. Additionally, the reforms unleashed pent-up demands and grievances, leading to social and political unrest. Gorbachev's reforms also had unintended consequences that contributed to the unraveling of the Soviet Union. The increased openness and freedom of expression allowed for greater criticism of the regime and sparked nationalist movements in various Soviet republics. This, in turn, led to growing demands for greater autonomy and ultimately contributed to the disintegration of the Soviet Union itself. The opening up of the Soviet Union under Gorbachev also exposed the inefficiencies and disparities between the Soviet and Western economies. As the Soviet citizens gained access to information about the living standards and economic opportunities enjoyed by their Western counterparts, dissatisfaction with the Soviet system grew, further undermining the legitimacy of the government. The Soviet economic decline and Gorbachev's reforms ultimately paved the way for the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The economic challenges, combined with political and nationalistic tensions, created a perfect storm that led to the collapse of the Soviet Empire. 
In December 1991, the Soviet Union ceased to exist, replaced by a collection of independent states. Chapter 16, Collapse of the Eastern Bloc, Revolutions, Political Changes in Eastern Europe, Fall of the Berlin Wall, and German Reunification. The collapse of the Eastern Bloc, which occurred in the late 1980s and early 1990s, marked a transformative period in world history. The Eastern Bloc, consisting of Soviet-aligned countries in Eastern Europe, had been under communist rule for decades. However, a combination of internal discontent, economic challenges, and changing geopolitical dynamics led to a wave of revolutions and political changes that ultimately brought an end to communist rule in the region. The fall of the Berlin Wall and German reunification were pivotal events during this period. In the 1980s, the Eastern Bloc faced numerous challenges. Economic stagnation, scarcity of goods, and inefficiencies in centrally planned economies had created widespread discontent among the population. The desire for political and economic reform grew, fueled by a yearning for greater individual freedoms, better living standards, and increased opportunities. In Poland, the Solidarity Movement emerged as a major force for change. Led by Lech Walesa, Solidarity challenged the ruling Communist Party, demanding political pluralism, worker rights, and economic reforms. The movement gained significant popular support and engaged in strikes, protests, and negotiations with the government. In 1989, the Polish government agreed to hold partially free elections, which resulted in a landslide victory for Solidarity. This marked a historic shift, as it was the first time in Eastern Europe that a communist regime was peacefully replaced through democratic means. The success of the Solidarity Movement in Poland inspired similar movements in other Eastern European countries. In Hungary, a series of reforms and a gradual move toward a market-oriented economy were initiated. The Hungarian government also opened its borders with Austria in 1989, allowing East Germans to flee to the West. This event foreshadowed the unraveling of the Eastern Bloc. In East Germany, the country was grappling with economic stagnation, political repression, and mass emigration. The government's inability to address these issues sparked widespread protests and demands for change. On November 9, 1989, in a historic moment, the Berlin Wall, which had symbolized the division between East and West, was opened, allowing people to freely cross between the two sides. The fall of the Berlin Wall marked a symbolic turning point, signaling the end of the Cold War era and the dismantling of the Iron Curtain. The fall of the Berlin Wall had a domino effect across Eastern Europe. Pro-democracy movements gained momentum, and one by one, communist regimes collapsed. In Czechoslovakia, the Velvet Revolution led by Vaslav Havel peacefully ended communist rule. In Romania, the brutal regime of Nicolae Ceausescu was overthrown in a violent revolution. Similar events unfolded in Bulgaria, Albania, and other Eastern European countries, culminating in the dissolution of the Eastern Bloc. The reunification of Germany became a focal point during this period. With the fall of the Berlin Wall, discussions intensified about the reunification of East and West Germany. Negotiations took place between the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, and the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, leading to the signing of the Treaty on the Final Settlement with respect to Germany in September 1990. On October 3, 1990, East and West Germany officially reunified, ending decades of division and becoming a significant milestone in European history. The collapse of the Eastern Bloc had far-reaching implications. It marked a victory for democracy, individual freedoms, and market-oriented economies. The countries of Eastern Europe embarked on a challenging process of political and economic transformation, undertaking reforms to transition from communism to capitalism and integrate into the global community. The collapse of the Eastern Bloc also reshaped the geopolitical landscape, 
shifting the balance of power and leading to the enlargement of the European Union and NATO. Chapter 17, Dissolution of the Soviet Union, Breakup into Independent States, The End of the Cold War, and the Triumph of Capitalism. The dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 was a watershed moment in global history, marking the end of an era and reshaping the geopolitical landscape. The breakup of the USSR into independent states was a result of a combination of internal factors, including economic challenges, political discontent, and nationalistic aspirations, as well as the broader global dynamics of the end of the Cold War. The dissolution of the Soviet Union also signaled the triumph of capitalism as the dominant economic system on the world stage. The disintegration of the Soviet Union was a complex process that unfolded over several years. Internal tensions had been building within the Soviet republics for some time. Ethnic, cultural, and historical differences, combined with long-standing grievances and desires for greater autonomy, contributed to a growing sense of nationalism among the various Soviet republics. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev assumed leadership of the Soviet Union and initiated a series of reforms aimed at modernizing the country and addressing its economic and political challenges. Gorbachev's policies of perestroika, restructuring, and glasnost, openness, were intended to revive the Soviet economy, promote transparency, and encourage public participation. However, these reforms also inadvertently sparked nationalist aspirations and calls for greater independence among the republics. The Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were the first to assert their independence from the Soviet Union. In 1990, they held free elections and declared their sovereignty, challenging the authority of the Soviet government. The other Soviet republics, inspired by these developments, followed suit, with some holding referendums to affirm their desire for independence. The unraveling of the Soviet Union gained momentum in August 1991, when a failed coup attempt by hardline Communist Party officials against Gorbachev exposed deep divisions within the Soviet leadership. The coup attempt weakened the central authority and emboldened the aspirations of the republics for greater independence. In the aftermath of the coup, the Soviet republics seized the opportunity to declare their independence, further eroding the power of the Soviet government. On December 25, 1991, the leaders of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus signed the Bella Visa Accords, effectively dissolving the Soviet Union and establishing the Commonwealth of Independent States CIS, as a loose association of independent states. The dissolution of the Soviet Union was a peaceful process, largely characterized by negotiations and agreements among the republics rather than violent conflicts. The end of the Cold War, marked by the dissolution of the Soviet Union, signaled a triumph for capitalism and the victory of Western liberal democracy over communism. The Cold War had been a decades-long ideological and geopolitical struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union, with capitalism and communism competing for global dominance. The collapse of the Soviet Union and the subsequent disintegration of the Eastern Bloc represented a decisive victory for the capitalist system and the principles of individual freedom, free markets, and democracy. The triumph of capitalism was exemplified by the rapid economic transformation that many of the former Soviet republics underwent after gaining independence. These countries embraced market-oriented reforms, liberalized their economies, and sought foreign investment and integration into the global economy. The transition from central planning to market economies, however, was not without challenges, as the former Soviet republics had to navigate the complexities of privatization, price liberalization, and building institutions to support a market-based system. The dissolution of the Soviet Union also had broader global implications. The end of the Cold War reduced the threat of a superpower confrontation and led to significant shifts in global power dynamics. The United States emerged as the sole superpower, with the collapse of the Soviet Union removing the primary challenger to its global influence. 
Chapter 18, Conclusion, The Enduring Legacy of the Cold War The Cold War, a prolonged ideological conflict between capitalism and communism, left an indelible mark on the history of the 20th century. This protracted struggle, which unfolded primarily between the United States and the Soviet Union, profoundly shaped the geopolitical landscape and had far-reaching consequences for political, economic, and social development worldwide. Although capitalism emerged as the prevailing system, the legacy of the Cold War continues to influence global affairs and the ongoing debates surrounding economic systems and political ideologies. The Cold War was not only a rivalry between two superpowers, it was a clash of competing ideologies. Capitalism, championed by the United States and its Western allies, emphasized private ownership, free markets, and individual initiative. It promoted political freedoms, civil rights, and the rule of law. Capitalism's proponents argued that it provided greater economic prosperity, innovation, and personal freedom. On the other side, communism, exemplified by the Soviet Union and its allies, advocated for collective ownership, central planning, and state control over the means of production. It aimed to establish social equality, social justice, and eliminate class distinctions. Communism's proponents saw it as a more equitable and just system that prioritized the welfare of the collective over individual interests. The Cold War's impact was felt across various realms of society. It shaped military strategies, leading to an arms race and the development of massive nuclear arsenals. The doctrine of mutually assured destruction MAD, emerged, which contributed to deterrence but also heightened the risks of a catastrophic conflict. The competition between the superpowers extended to technological advancements, scientific achievements, and space exploration. Economically, the Cold War drove both sides to invest significant resources in their respective systems. Capitalist countries sought to demonstrate the superiority of their market-based economies by promoting economic growth, technological innovation, and consumerism. Communist countries focused on industrialization, state-controlled economies, and providing social welfare programs to their populations. The economic competition between the superpowers spurred advancements in various fields, including science, technology, and industry. The political landscape was also profoundly shaped by the Cold War. Proxy conflicts and interventions occurred in various regions, as the United States and the Soviet Union supported opposing sides in local conflicts. These proxy wars, such as the Korean War and the Vietnam War, led to immense human suffering and political instability, exacerbating tensions between the superpowers. Ultimately, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc marked the end of the Cold War era. The triumph of capitalism and the perceived failures of communism led to a re-evaluation of political and economic systems worldwide. The dissolution of the Soviet Union and the subsequent transformations in Eastern Europe and other former communist states resulted in the adoption of market-oriented reforms, privatization, and a shift toward democratic governance. However, while capitalism emerged victorious, the legacy of the Cold War continues to shape global affairs and debates. The impacts of the conflict are still evident in the ongoing struggles for economic development, social justice, and political stability in many regions. The divide between capitalist and communist systems continues to influence international relations, with countries pursuing varying degrees of economic liberalization and political freedoms. Furthermore, the Cold War's legacy is apparent in the ongoing debates surrounding economic systems and political ideologies. The question of whether capitalism or communism provides the most equitable and sustainable path to development remains contentious. These debates extend beyond the economic realm to encompass issues such as income inequality, social welfare, and the role of the state in the economy. More Information and Facts Part 1, Non-Aligned Movement, A Quest for Neutrality and Independence 
During the Cold War, amidst the intense rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, a significant global force emerged known as the Non-Aligned Movement NAM. Comprising countries from various regions, the Non-Aligned Movement sought to maintain a position of neutrality and independence, refusing to align themselves with either of the superpowers. The movement not only represented a quest for autonomy but also highlighted the existence of alternative paths and ideologies beyond the binary of capitalism and communism. The non-aligned movement originated in the context of the decolonization process that swept across Africa, Asia, and Latin America in the post-World War II era. Many newly independent nations, liberated from colonial rule, were wary of becoming pawns in the power struggle between the superpowers. These countries sought to preserve their newly gained independence, assert their national identities, and pursue their own paths of political, economic, and social development. The movement formally took shape during the 1955 Bandung Conference held in Bandung, Indonesia. This conference brought together leaders from 29 newly independent Asian and African countries, including luminaries such as Jabaharlal Nehru of India, Sukarno of Indonesia, and Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt. The Bandung Conference marked a significant moment in history as it provided a platform for these nations to voice their concerns, assert their independence, and establish a united front against the dominance of the superpowers. The founding principles of the non-aligned movement were rooted in the pursuit of peace, self-determination, and national sovereignty. The member states sought to forge a collective identity based on their shared experiences of colonialism and a desire to navigate their own paths in a bipolar world. They aimed to promote a third way that would distance them from the competing ideological camps of capitalism and communism. One of the key tenets of the non-aligned movement was the principle of peaceful coexistence. NAM members advocated for diplomatic engagement, negotiation, and the resolution of conflicts through peaceful means. They rejected the use of force or military intervention as instruments of foreign policy and called for respect for national sovereignty and territorial integrity. The non-aligned movement also emphasized economic development and social justice as crucial elements of their agenda. Many member states were grappling with the legacies of colonial exploitation and sought to build self-reliant economies that prioritized the welfare of their people. They aimed to break free from economic dependence on the superpowers and establish equitable economic systems that would benefit their populations. Throughout the Cold War, the non-aligned movement grew in strength and influence. Its membership expanded to include countries from all continents, totaling over 100 member states at its peak. The NAM became an important global force, representing the aspirations and interests of the developing world. The non-aligned movement played a significant role in shaping global dynamics. Its collective voice challenged the dominance of the superpowers and provided an alternative narrative to the bipolar framework of the Cold War. The NAM facilitated dialogue and cooperation among its member states, promoting South-South cooperation and advocating for the interests of the Global South on the international stage. The non-aligned movement also actively engaged in global issues such as disarmament, decolonization, human rights, and sustainable development. It called for nuclear disarmament, championed the rights of oppressed peoples, and advocated for a fair and just international order. The movement's influence extended beyond its membership, as it was able to shape debates and policies at the United Nations and other international forums. While the non-aligned movement sought to maintain neutrality, it faced challenges and criticisms from various quarters. Critics argued that the movement was ineffective and prone to divisions due to differing national interests and ideologies among member states. Some accused certain member states of covertly aligning with one of the superpowers despite their professed neutrality. Furthermore, the changing dynamics of the global order, especially with the end of the Cold War, posed new challenges to the non-aligned movement. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the bipolar world order dissolved, and new power configurations emerged. 
This shift, coupled with globalization and changing geopolitical realities, necessitated a re-evaluation of the movement's relevance and agenda in the 21st century. Part 2, Cultural Cold War, The Battle for Hearts and Minds The ideological battle of the Cold War extended far beyond politics and economics. It also permeated the realm of culture, where both the United States and the Soviet Union engaged in a fierce struggle to shape global perceptions and win the hearts and minds of people around the world. Through cultural diplomacy, including art, literature, cinema, and music, both superpowers sought to promote their respective ideologies, values, and ways of life. Exploring the cultural dimensions of the Cold War provides a more comprehensive understanding of the influence and impact of this global conflict. Culture became a potent tool for the superpowers in their efforts to assert their ideological superiority and rally support. The United States, representing the capitalist bloc, aimed to promote Western values such as democracy, individualism, consumerism, and the pursuit of happiness. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, sought to project the virtues of socialism, collective solidarity, social equality, and the promise of a better future for the working class. Art and literature were critical arenas where the cultural battle of the Cold War unfolded. Both the United States and the Soviet Union supported artists and writers who aligned with their respective ideologies, offering financial and ideological incentives to promote their cause. In the West, abstract expressionism and other forms of modern art were championed as symbols of freedom and individualism, embodying the principles of capitalism and democratic values. The CIA, through organizations such as the Congress for Cultural Freedom, covertly funded cultural activities and publications that portrayed the West in a positive light. In the Soviet Union and its satellite states, socialist realism dominated the cultural landscape. Socialist realism was an art form that sought to depict the Soviet Union as a utopian society, with an emphasis on the achievements of the working class, industrial progress, and the collective spirit of the people. Writers and artists were expected to produce works that promoted the ideals of socialism and the goals of the Communist Party. Nonconformist artists and dissident writers who challenged the official narratives faced censorship and persecution. Cinema played a crucial role in shaping public opinion and disseminating ideological messages during the Cold War. In the United States, Hollywood emerged as a powerful tool for projecting American values and ideals worldwide. Films that celebrated American exceptionalism, freedom, and the American way of life were exported to various countries, influencing popular culture and perceptions of the West. Movies like Rocky and Top Gun became symbols of American heroism and the triumph of individualism. The Soviet Union, too, recognized the power of cinema and used it as a means of propaganda. Soviet filmmakers produced films that glorified the achievements of the Soviet state and its socialist system. The works of renowned directors such as Sergei Eisenstein and Andrei Tarkovsky showcased the grandeur of Soviet history and culture, while promoting the values of collectivism and social equality. These films were not only intended for domestic consumption but also played a significant role in shaping the perception of the Soviet Union abroad. Music, especially popular music, also became a battleground in the cultural Cold War. In the West, genres such as rock and roll, jazz, and pop music embodied the spirit of individualism, rebellion, and freedom of expression. Musicians like Elvis Presley, The Beatles, and Bob Dylan became icons of the counterculture and vehicles for challenging traditional norms and promoting social change. In the Soviet Union, the state-controlled music industry aimed to promote songs that conveyed the message of collective harmony and unity. Folk music, patriotic songs, and state-approved pop music were favored, while Western music was often seen as a corrupting influence. However, despite the state's attempts to control musical expression, underground movements emerged, and bootleg copies of Western music circulated among Soviet youth, 
providing a glimpse of the outside world and alternative perspectives. The Cultural Cold War had a significant impact on global perceptions and the shaping of identities. It contributed to the polarization of ideologies and the division of the world into Western and Eastern spheres of influence. The battle for cultural dominance also had consequences for intellectual and artistic freedom, as artists and writers often found themselves caught between the demands of state ideology and personal expression. However, the cultural Cold War was not a one-sided affair. It gave rise to resistance and artistic movements that challenged the dominant narratives imposed by the superpowers. Artists and writers, both within the Western and Eastern blocs, engaged in acts of cultural defiance, producing works that subverted the official ideologies and explored alternative perspectives. Part 3, Proxy Wars, Local Struggles, Global Rivalries The Cold War era witnessed numerous proxy wars, where local conflicts for power and influence became intertwined with the broader geopolitical rivalry between the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. These conflicts, directly or indirectly fueled by the superpowers, resulted in extensive human suffering and had far-reaching geopolitical implications. Delving deeper into specific proxy wars such as those in Angola, Nicaragua, Afghanistan, and the Congo provides a clearer understanding of the complexities and consequences of these conflicts during the Cold War. Angola the proxy war in Angola, which lasted from the mid-1970s to the late 1980s, was a battleground for competing Cold War interests. Following Angola's independence from Portugal in 1975, three main factions vied for control, the Marxist Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola MPLA, supported by the Soviet Union and Cuba, the National Front for the Liberation of Angola FNLA, backed by the United States and Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, initially supported by China and later receiving aid from the United States and South Africa. The Cold War rivalries between the superpowers fueled the conflict in Angola. The MPLA government received substantial military and economic support from the Soviet Union and Cuba, while the United States, through covert operations and support for UNITA, aimed to counter Soviet influence in the region. The conflict resulted in extensive human suffering, with the Angolan population caught in the crossfire, enduring violence, displacement, and economic hardships. Nicaragua The proxy war in Nicaragua, often referred to as the Contra War, unfolded during the 1980s. The Sandinista National Liberation Front FSLN, a Marxist revolutionary group, had overthrown the U.S.-backed Somoza dictatorship in 1979 and established a socialist government. The United States, fearing the spread of communism, provided military and financial support to the Contras, a rebel group composed of former members of the Somoza regime and other anti-Sandinista forces. The conflict in Nicaragua became a hotbed of Cold War tensions. The United States, viewing the Sandinista government as a Soviet-backed threat, sought to undermine its influence through support for the Contras. The conflict resulted in a humanitarian crisis, with widespread human rights abuses, displacement, and economic devastation. Afghanistan The proxy war in Afghanistan which spanned from 1979 to 1989, was one of the most significant and consequential conflicts of the Cold War era. After a Soviet-backed coup in 1978, a communist government took power in Afghanistan, triggering a widespread insurgency known as the Mujahideen. The United States, along with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, provided military and financial support to the Mujahideen, seeing them as a means to counter Soviet influence in the region. The conflict in Afghanistan became a focal point of the Cold War, with the Soviet Union directly intervening to prop up the communist government. The United States, in a bid to weaken Soviet influence, channeled support to the Mujahideen, who eventually succeeded in driving out the Soviet forces. 
However, the aftermath of the conflict had far-reaching consequences, contributing to the rise of militant groups and the emergence of the Taliban. The Congo The proxy war in the Congo, formerly known as Zaire, took place primarily during the 1960s and was marked by a complex web of local and international interests. The Congo had gained independence from Belgium in 1960, but the country was plagued by political instability and regional tensions. The conflict involved various Congolese factions vying for power, as well as interventions by neighboring countries and external actors. Superpower involvement in the Congo conflict was evident, with the United States and the Soviet Union backing opposing factions. The United States supported the government of Joseph Mobutu, providing military aid and financial assistance, while the Soviet Union and its allies supported various rebel groups. The conflict resulted in widespread violence, political instability, and economic decline, with the Congolese people bearing the brunt of the suffering. These examples illustrate the destructive nature of proxy wars during the Cold War. Local struggles for power were amplified and prolonged by the involvement of external actors seeking to advance their own interests and influence. These conflicts had devastating consequences, including loss of life, displacement, economic hardships, and the exacerbation of political and social divisions within the affected countries. Furthermore, proxy wars had significant geopolitical implications. They contributed to the polarization of the world into competing blocs aligned with the superpowers, undermining the prospects for peaceful resolution of conflicts and heightening tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. The proxy wars also revealed the complexities and limitations of the superpowers' ability to control events on the ground, as local dynamics often defied their expectations and strategies. Part 4 – Nuclear Arms Control and Disarmament – Mitigating the Risks of Global Annihilation While the previous account touched upon the arms race and the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, a deeper examination of the efforts to control and reduce nuclear weapons sheds light on the attempts made during the Cold War to mitigate the risks of global annihilation. Key agreements and initiatives, such as the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks SALT, and the Treaty on the Nonproliferation of Nuclear Weapons NPT, played crucial roles in shaping nuclear arms control and disarmament efforts. As the United States and the Soviet Union amassed vast nuclear arsenals during the Cold War, the world grew increasingly concerned about the catastrophic consequences of a nuclear conflict. In response, international efforts were made to establish mechanisms for arms control and disarmament, aiming to reduce the risk of nuclear war and prevent the further proliferation of nuclear weapons. One of the significant milestones in nuclear arms control was the signing of the Partial Test Ban Treaty PTBT, in 1963. This treaty, signed by the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom, prohibited the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, underwater, and in outer space. The PTBT was a critical step toward reducing the environmental and health hazards associated with nuclear testing and promoting the peaceful use of nuclear energy. The Strategic Arms Limitation Talks SALT, between the United States and the Soviet Union marked another significant development in nuclear arms control. The SALT negotiations resulted in two major agreements, SALT-I, signed in 1972, and SALT-II, signed in 1979. These agreements aimed to limit the number of strategic nuclear weapons and their delivery systems, including intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs, and submarine-launched ballistic missiles SLBMs. SALT-I established an interim agreement freezing the number of ICBMs and SLBMs, while SALT II proposed further reductions in strategic arms. The SALT agreements contributed to a period of relative stability in nuclear arms competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. They symbolized a shared recognition of the dangers posed by excessive nuclear arsenals and provided a framework for continued dialogue and cooperation. However, the ratification of SALT II faced challenges in the United States, 
and the agreement was never fully implemented due to Cold War tensions and geopolitical developments. Another crucial pillar of nuclear arms control and non-proliferation efforts is the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons NPT, which came into force in 1970. The NPT, often described as the cornerstone of the global non-proliferation regime, seeks to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons while promoting the peaceful use of nuclear energy. The treaty has three main pillars, disarmament, non-proliferation, and the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Under the NPT, nuclear weapon states commit to disarmament efforts, while non-nuclear weapon states pledge not to develop or acquire nuclear weapons. The treaty also established a framework for international cooperation on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, with safeguards to prevent the diversion of nuclear materials for military purposes. The NPT has been widely ratified, with almost all countries in the world becoming parties to the treaty. Efforts to control and reduce nuclear weapons gained momentum in the 1980s with the signing of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces INF, treaty between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1987. The INF Treaty aimed to eliminate an entire category of nuclear weapons by prohibiting the development, testing, and deployment of intermediate-range missiles. The treaty was hailed as a significant step toward disarmament and helped ease tensions during the final years of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War brought renewed impetus for nuclear arms control and disarmament. The Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty start, negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union resulted in the signing of the Stardai Treaty in 1991 and the subsequent START II Treaty in 1993. These agreements aimed to significantly reduce the number of strategic nuclear weapons and their delivery systems. Although significant progress has been made in nuclear arms control and disarmament, challenges persist. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty CTBT, which aims to ban all nuclear explosive testing, has not yet entered into force due to the non-ratification by several key countries. The proliferation of nuclear weapons and the emergence of new nuclear armed states pose ongoing challenges to the global non-proliferation regime. Part 5 – Impact on Developing Countries, Cold War Competition and the Quest for Self-Determination the Cold War had a profound impact on developing countries, particularly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The superpowers' competition for influence in these regions shaped their socio-political landscapes, economic development, and the quest for self-determination. Examining the impact of the Cold War on developing countries provides valuable insights into the complexities of global power dynamics during this era. Superpower Competition and Proxy Conflicts Developing countries became important arenas for the superpowers to extend their influence and promote their respective ideologies. Both the United States and the Soviet Union supported opposing sides in local conflicts, often turning them into proxy wars. These conflicts, fueled by Cold War rivalries, inflicted significant human suffering, political instability, and economic devastation. For instance, in Africa, proxy wars erupted in countries such as Angola, Mozambique, and Ethiopia, where local struggles for power were exacerbated by external support. In Asia, the Vietnam War epitomized the Cold War's impact, with the United States supporting South Vietnam against the communist forces of North Vietnam, backed by the Soviet Union and China. Latin America also experienced proxy conflicts, with the United States supporting anti-communist regimes, while the Soviet Union backed leftist revolutionary movements. Sociopolitical Landscapes The superpowers' competition for influence influenced the sociopolitical landscapes of developing countries. The United States and the Soviet Union sought to cultivate alliances with local leaders who aligned with their respective ideologies, often at the expense of indigenous movements and aspirations for self-determination. This led to the entrenchment of authoritarian regimes and the suppression of dissenting voices in many countries. In some instances, 
the Cold War rivalry led to the destabilization and overthrow of democratically elected governments. The United States, under the policy of containment, supported coups against perceived communist or socialist-leaning governments, as witnessed in Iran, Guatemala, Chile, and many other countries. Similarly, the Soviet Union sought to bolster communist regimes and revolutionary movements that aligned with its interests. Economic Development The competition between the superpowers also had significant implications for economic development in developing countries. Both the United States and the Soviet Union used economic aid and assistance as tools to gain influence and promote their respective systems. Economic aid was often conditional, with the superpowers requiring recipient countries to align with their political ideologies or strategic interests. The United States, through programs such as the Marshall Plan and the Alliance for Progress, aimed to promote capitalism and market-oriented economies, providing financial assistance and promoting trade. The Soviet Union, through its Council for Mutual Economic Assistance Comicon, provided economic aid to socialist and communist regimes, emphasizing central planning and state-controlled economies. However, the economic assistance provided by the superpowers often came with strings attached. The conditional nature of aid sometimes perpetuated dependence, stifled local industries, and hindered genuine economic development. Developing countries found themselves caught in a complex web of alliances and dependencies, often struggling to chart their own paths of economic progress. The concept of the third world and non-aligned countries. The concept of the third world emerged during the Cold War to describe countries that were not aligned with either the capitalist or communist blocs. These countries, often developing nations, sought to maintain their autonomy, independence, and pursue their own paths of political, economic, and social development. Non-aligned countries, such as India, Egypt, Indonesia, and Ghana, played a crucial role in the global arena. These countries, which comprised a significant portion of the developing world, sought to distance themselves from the superpower rivalry and promote a third way that transcended the binary of capitalism and communism. They advocated for principles such as national sovereignty, self-determination, disarmament, and social justice. Non-aligned countries sought to assert their interests and challenge the dominance of the superpowers in global affairs. They played key roles in international forums such as the United Nations, the Non-Aligned Movement, and the Group of 77, influencing debates on decolonization, economic justice, and the restructuring of the international order. Part 6, Cold War Espionage and Intelligence, The Shadows of the Superpowers The conflict between the superpowers during the Cold War was not limited to overt military confrontations or ideological battles. It was accompanied by extensive espionage and intelligence activities that took place behind the scenes. The activities of intelligence agencies, such as the Central Intelligence Agency CIA, in the United States and the Komitet Gosudarstvenoi Bezopasnosti KGB, in the Soviet Union, played a crucial role in gathering information, conducting covert operations, and shaping geopolitical strategies. Investigating the spy games and covert operations of the Cold War adds an intriguing dimension to the historical account. Espionage as a Tool of the Cold War Espionage was a pervasive feature of the Cold War, as both the United States and the Soviet Union sought to gain strategic advantage and protect their interests. The superpowers engaged in extensive intelligence gathering, counterintelligence operations, and covert actions. They aimed to acquire information about each other's military capabilities, political intentions, technological advancements, and diplomatic activities. The CIA and the KGB were at the forefront of these efforts. The CIA, established in 1947, engaged in clandestine operations, information collection, and analysis to support U.S. national security interests. The KGB, founded in 1954, served as the Soviet Union's primary intelligence agency, responsible for gathering intelligence and conducting covert activities both at home and abroad. 
Covert Operations and Subversion Covert operations were a central element of Cold War espionage. Both the United States and the Soviet Union engaged in efforts to undermine each other's interests through sabotage, subversion, and support for proxy groups. Covert operations aimed to destabilize governments, influence elections, gather intelligence, and promote the superpowers' respective ideologies. The United States, through the CIA, conducted covert operations to support anti-communist forces in various parts of the world. Notable examples include the CIA's involvement in the overthrow of governments in Iran, 1953, Guatemala, 1954, and Chile, 1973. The CIA also supported paramilitary groups, such as the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba, 1961, and the arming of Mujahideen fighters during the Soviet-Afghan War, 1979-1989. The Soviet Union, through the KGB, engaged in its own covert activities, such as supporting communist movements and revolutionary groups worldwide. It provided financial aid, weapons, training, and intelligence to groups aligned with its interests. Notable examples include support for the communist insurgency in Greece, assistance to leftist groups in Latin America, and aid to revolutionary movements in Africa. Intelligence Gathering and Technological Advancements The Cold War spurred significant advancements in intelligence gathering techniques and technology. Both the United States and the Soviet Union invested heavily in developing sophisticated surveillance methods, code-breaking capabilities, and spy technologies. Signals Intelligence SIGINT, the interception and analysis of electronic communications, played a crucial role in gathering information during the Cold War. Both superpowers established extensive SIGINT networks to monitor military communications, diplomatic correspondence, and technological developments. The United States relied on organizations such as the National Security Agency NSA, to intercept and decipher encrypted communications. The Soviet Union had its own SIGIN capabilities through the KGB and the main intelligence directorate, GRU. Technological advancements also played a pivotal role in espionage. Satellites, for example, provided valuable imagery intelligence IMINT, for monitoring military installations and gathering information about enemy activities. The development of spy planes, such as the U-2 and the State Route 71 Blackbird, allowed for high-altitude reconnaissance missions that provided critical intelligence. Double Agents and Moles The Cold War saw the rise of infamous double agents and moles who infiltrated intelligence agencies on behalf of the enemy. These individuals operated at the highest levels of espionage, providing valuable intelligence to their handlers and creating significant security breaches. One of the most notorious cases was that of Kim Philby, a British intelligence officer who spied for the Soviet Union while working for the British Secret Intelligence Service MI6. Philby's betrayal and his role as a high-ranking KGB agent sent shockwaves through the intelligence community and highlighted the extent of Soviet infiltration. Similarly, the United States experienced its own espionage scandals, such as the case of Aldrich Ames, a CIA officer who worked as a double agent for the Soviet Union and later Russia. Ames' actions compromised numerous CIA assets and operations, illustrating the vulnerabilities within intelligence agencies. Part 7, Cold War and Popular Culture, Reflecting Fears and Shaping Memory The influence of the Cold War extended beyond the realms of politics and diplomacy, seeping into popular culture and leaving an indelible mark on literature, films, and television shows. Cold War themes, such as espionage, nuclear anxiety, and ideological confrontation, found their way into various forms of entertainment, reflecting the fears and anxieties of the era. Analyzing the representation of the Cold War in popular culture provides valuable insights into its enduring impact on society and collective memory. Espionage and Spy Thrillers 
The Cold War provided fertile ground for the proliferation of espionage narratives and spy thrillers in popular culture. Works such as Ian Fleming's James Bond novels and John le Carre's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy captivated audiences, portraying a world of secret agents, double crosses, and high-stakes international intrigue. These stories tapped into the fascination with the shadowy world of espionage, mirroring the real-life spy games between the superpowers. They often depicted the moral ambiguities, the dangers of nuclear brinkmanship, and the relentless pursuit of national security. Spy thrillers became a means for audiences to explore and grapple with the complexities and uncertainties of the Cold War world. Nuclear Anxiety and Dystopian Visions The specter of nuclear war loomed large during the Cold War, and this fear permeated popular culture. Books like Neville Shoots on the Beach and films such as Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove presented dystopian visions of a world on the brink of nuclear annihilation. These works captured the existential dread and paranoia that characterized the era, reflecting the deep-seated anxieties about the consequences of the arms race and the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Cold War-era science fiction also explored themes of nuclear anxiety. Films like The Day the Earth Stood Still and Godzilla utilized giant monsters and alien invasions as metaphors for the fears of nuclear devastation. These narratives served as cautionary tales, reminding audiences of the potential consequences of atomic warfare and the need for peace. Ideological Confrontation and Propaganda the ideological clash between capitalism and communism provided fodder for Cold War narratives in popular culture. Films and television shows often depicted the conflict between the free world and the evil empire, portraying a stark dichotomy between the values of democracy and individualism versus the collectivist and oppressive nature of communism. In the United States, films such as Red Dawn and Rocky IV embodied this narrative, presenting heroic American protagonists battling against Soviet aggression. These stories served as powerful vehicles for reinforcing nationalistic sentiment and promoting the superiority of the American way of life. In the Soviet Union, cinema played a crucial role in shaping public perceptions and promoting the ideals of socialism. Films like Battleship Potemkin and Solaris showcased the triumphs of the Soviet system and explored existential themes within a socialist framework. Cold War in Literature and Art Cold War themes were not limited to the realm of film and television. They also found expression in literature, poetry, and visual art. Authors like George Orwell with his novel 1984 and Alexander Solzhenitsyn with his works on the Soviet Gulag system depicted dystopian societies and the erosion of individual freedoms. Artists like Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein incorporated Cold War iconography and imagery into their works, commenting on consumerism, propaganda, and the commodification of popular culture. Their art captured the visual aesthetics and symbolism of the era, serving as a reflection of the zeitgeist. In conclusion, the Cold War left an indelible mark on popular culture, permeating literature, films, and television shows. The portrayal of espionage, nuclear anxiety, and ideological confrontation in popular culture reflected the fears and anxieties of the era. These cultural representations not only entertained but also allowed audiences to engage with and make sense of the complexities and uncertainties of the Cold War world. The enduring impact of the Cold War on popular culture continues to shape our collective memory and understanding of this transformative period in history. We've now reached the end of our journey today, thank you for letting the tales of old be your backdrop and remember, history isn't just about the past. It's about understanding our present and shaping our future.